Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on Digital Health Foundation. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I live and work on. For me, that is a Awabakal land. And I'd like to pay respect to First Nations people for their enduring culture and contribution to this vast region. My name is Emily Parsons and I'm from the PHN education team. I'm joined today by Peter Mullen, PHN Digital Health Officer for the last four years. Peter has assisted, oh, sorry, for the last four years, Peter has assisted general specialist and allied health practices in implementing a range of digital health solutions. I just wanted to mention before we start that this session is being recorded. The recording and the PDF slides will become available on our PHN website in the Education Library over the next few days. As attendees, your camera and microphone will be restricted. However, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please place them in the chat or question box, box which you will find located in your control panel. Towards the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session where we will address these questions. If you could please complete the evaluation that will pop up at the end of the session, your feedback is extremely important to us and helps us to plan for future education sessions. I will now hand over to Peter. Thanks, Emily. I'll just share my screen um, and if you can just confirm if you can see my slides now. The slideshow. That's, that's you... right, Peter. I can see them. Excellent. All righty. Great. Okay, so welcome everybody today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to uh, the traditional owners on the lands in which we meet, and that for me that's the Waramai uh, lands. I'm up here in Port Stephens, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to cover a whole range of topics today, uh, cyber security, informed consent, privacy, and I'd also like to actually touch on the My Health app as well. Um, I know we've got a range of attendees from a whole lot of different industries. We've got general practice, we've got some of our commission service providers, we've got some allied health and a whole range of job roles within that spectrum as well. So I think what we'll present today is, is valuable for everybody um, and if there's any questions as, as Emily said we'll uh, address those at the end. If there's anything really specific we might have to take that offline. Uh, but look we'll get on into it. Uh, the other thing I should mention is look I'm going to cover a lot of topics I'm going to cover them in a general nature. So obviously you need to look at your circumstances or your business's circumstance or your practice's circumstances in that specific nature. So, Okay, so let's kick off and into data security. So who's the threat and why is the health industry such a target? Um, I think we've all seen or thought, you know, of cyber security or, or cyber criminals, you know, that lonely person like the graphic there shows sitting at home, tapping away on their laptop late at night, just trying to hack into computers. Um, that's really, it's a misnomer. Uh, cyber crime at the moment, it is, it's organised crime. And in some cases, it's even state sponsored. So it is a huge business uh, and it's very valuable business. The, the global turnover is ridiculous. Um, why health information? If your credit card information gets stolen and sold on the dark web, the, the seller's going to get about $5 for it. And the reason for that is credit card information, fairly common, also fairly quick use. They'll, they'll be in, they'll be out of the credit card and you know bank security protocols or something will pick it up and block that card. If someone gets hold of a health file, it's a lot more um, valuable to them. Health files are apparently, so I hear, um, trading at over $1,000 on the black market on, or on the black web. Uh, and the reason for that is there's a lot of information in a health file that can be actually used to create a second or a fake identity or a duplicate identity. The other thing is if somebody's got hold of health information, it's a lot more emotive. People are a lot more guarded about their health details. And that means that, that you know, there's a lot of pressure on uh, companies if, if there is a breach around that information to, to either get that information back or contain that breach. So yeah, and so that's that's why health information or health services like yourselves are very much targets for cybercrime. I think the other thing that's sometimes thought is they only go after the big guys. You know, we've all heard of the, the um, Medibank private breach and things like that. Uh, some of those bigger breaches, Optus, they don't just go after the bigger targets. They are also after small targets. So don't think just because you're a small practice, a couple of doctors or a couple of allied health professionals, mental health service, 
drug and alcohol service, that you're not a target. You are a target. Uh, cyber security experts tend to talk in terms of, it's not if a cyber event occurs in your business, it's when it occurs. And I think that's really important to remember. It's probably going to happen at some point in time, some sort of cyber security event, some sort of data breach. And that's why it's important to understand the framework which you work in and also to understand what your response for that needs to be. You need to be prepared for that to happen. So let's have a look at the, uh, the top five sectors to notify breaches to the Office of the Australian Information Commission. This has come out of their data breach report uh, for the period January to June 2023. You can see that as a health service provider, we're winning. Not a good stat we want to be winning on. Uh, finance second, recruitment agencies legal and insurance following them behind. That statistic though with health services providers has been constant for the last, I don't know how many years, in several years, if not since they've been recording the events. Uh, health services is also always number one. The other interesting statistic that comes out of that figure is that of those breaches that were reported, 63% of those 63 breaches were actually impacting 100 people or less. And that's what I mean, they're not, breaches don't always occur, these events don't always occur for larger companies, they can occur for smaller companies or smaller practices as well. So I think that's really important to keep bear in mind. I'm going to jump back a little bit in time here and, and why I'm doing that, it's, it's also very interesting to look at what's the trend, what's happening in the cyber security in this in area, what's, you know, where, where are the breaches happening. This is the data report from July to December 21. And as you can see, malicious or criminal attacks at 55%, system fault 4%, human error 41%. Human error is quite big there. That's something you can obviously work on in your practice or in your business. Um, but you know, criminal attacks, malicious attacks, again, you can put in uh, systems in place to actually prevent those. But if we jump forward to the current report, which again came out January to June this year, you can see that malicious or criminal attacks is up to 70%. So it's building year on year, the, the growth in the industry, and I hate to call it industry, but that's what it is, um, is just growing. Human error still at 26%. I would actually argue that, that the number in human error, the actual data breaches, probably hasn't changed a great deal. Human error still accounts for a lot of it. It's just the growth of the malicious or criminal attacks has actually shrunk the percentage, not necessarily maybe the number that sits behind it. 42% of all data breaches resulted from cyber security incidents. Um, so if we break that down, and I'll cover ransomware in a minute, 31% um, ransomware, but if we look at those um, cyber security incidents, so compromised or stolen credentials, phishing, uh, so compromised credentials, again, phishing is just a term for, um, you know, trying to get information through, it might be a dodgy email, pretending to be something else, uh, a creditor or a well-known company, uh, we've all probably got emails, you know, pretending to be from Netflix to say your um, subscription subs, um, expired, click here to renew it. That's the sort of thing that a phishing attack is. Hacking again is actually hacking onto a system. Malware, 8%, again, malware is just introducing um, malicious software onto your system in, in, to try and gain access to that or steal credentials. And a brute force attack, again, compromised credentials, it's just, basically a bank of computers attacking your system to try and break through. But we can see there's 69% involves compromised credential attacks and I think that's important. There's a number of things that we can do to look at those. Um, as I said, we're looking, it is the number one area for credential attacks, phishing, malware, brute force attack or stolen credentials. How do we mitigate those? Staff training is probably the big one and that's one that you can all impact within your business, within your workspace, um, making sure that staff are up to date. I will give some information on training that's available, but making sure they understand those concepts so that what is phishing, how do they, you know, how do they occur, what to look for when they get an email that might be suspicious, what to do when they get an email that might be suspicious, what should they be doing with data if they, um, you know, if they're collecting patient data, how does that get treated and everything else. So staff training is very important. Web filtering, again, these things come in then in your cybersecurity software, web filtering, email filtering, um, having strong password policies, and I'll come back to revisit that one uh, in detail in a little bit. Multi-factor authentication, again, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, and business continuity and disaster planning is key. As I said, 
you've really got to be prepared for these events because they are so common and it's likely that you will be involved in some sort of data breach or cyber security event. So let's look at passwords. Um, password is not a password. This information has come from NordPass. NordPass is a company that does uh, password manager software. These are the top 10 passwords in 2022. Uh, I think we've all seen them. They are all so easy to crack. You can see there, it's literally seconds to break into any system that's using that information or that, that sort of password, that level of password. I'll break that down a little bit further so we can look at the complexity, but also we're going to do a little bit of retrospective uh, looking here as well. If you've seen my presentations previously, I have used this slide before, but it's a 2022 version. This is the 2023 version that Hive Systems produce. Um, and in fact, there's in a whole lot of new information. Um, and you can see there, you know, a lot of the, the minimum protocols for passwords when you're setting passwords on software or on websites, it might be eight characters. You can see there a number only password is going to be cracked instantly, lowercase letters instantly, uppercase and lowercase letters 28 seconds, uppercase lowercase letters, uh, where are we, two minutes and five minutes if you've got a really complex one including symbols. So it's really important to understand how these cyber events can occur and, and the power of the computers that are actually uh, targeting potentially your business or your, your data, your patient files. Why I'd like to look back, the 2022 graph of that, if I use my example, I use passphrase security as something you can actually use to sometimes create a password. Uh, obviously, we want to make it com complex. But in 2022, if I use the password just using HNECC, PHN, eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, it was 22 minutes. 2023, that graph is now t telling me it's 28 seconds. So you can see the time is just coming down just rapidly over time. Even at 11 characters, it was 400 years, now we're down to three years. But you can also see by ramping up that complexity, ramping up your password security, it goes from 28 seconds to three years. Hopefully your system is going to pick up that attempt within that time. If it isn't, you should be looking at new security software. But that's another story. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that's how quickly, in if you've got weak password security, that you can actually um, be hacked by, by a brute force attack or, or, or a concentrated attack. The other thing is don't use that password. You know, a lot of people use the same password across multiple platforms. The issue there is if it gets picked up or hacked in one platform, all of a sudden, the, you know, someone who's got nefarious purposes in mind has access to multiple platforms. So that's important as well. The other thing is you can have the most complex password, but if you don't store it securely, then you know you're leaving yourself open as well. Classic example of that, this fine looking gentleman is from the Hawaiian Emergency Agency. And in 2018, the agent the Hawaiian Emergency Agency actually broadcast a fake nuclear emergency warning, went out over their systems uh, that they are under a nuclear attack. This gentleman fronted up to the media afterwards and was good enough to explain what happened and everything else. Um, however, the astute people who are actually um, watching that interview noticed something a little bit un interesting on his computer monitor. And if we zoom in on that, we can actually see that the password is stored on a sticky note on the computer monitor. So you can have the most complex password you like, but if it's that easy to find, it doesn't matter how complex it is. So just make sure password storage is key. Um, there's a lot of things you can use. You can use password uh, manager software. That's probably the ideal situation. Don't store it on sticky notes. Don't put it in a notebook and drop it in the top drawer. Don't put it under the keyboard. Don't attach it to you know, um, the hard drive. Um, don't use spreadsheets or a Word document because again, if somebody accesses that, they've got access to all of your passwords across all of your platforms. So really, the gold standard is you're using password software, uh, sorry, password manager software. Uh, and that's something you can look at. The other thing is there are within software, I know I was looking at best practice the other day, I know in best practice, I know that's a GP uh, centric uh, piece of software, but I would assume it's probably common across a lot of other platforms that they do allow you to actually control passwords, how often they secure, sorry, how often they mature so that you've got to reset them, how complex they've got to be, and things like that. So you can control those settings. It's important to make sure, yes, it's easy to all have the same password, but that shouldn't happen. Sharing of passwords is just a big no-no. Um, it's it's got to be everybody uses their own profile, has their own platform, and, and uses their own passwords and is responsible for that. You can get um, 
enterprise level password software so that you know you don't not everybody has to have their own subscription just work out what's the best for you but i would strongly suggest that anybody that's got personal or private or um, patient data that you're protecting you know make sure you've got very strong password protocols in place i'm going to quickly touch on ransomware so ransomware is a type of malware that's designed to prevent or limit access to your system and what it does it'll either lock down your screen or it'll lock away your files um, until you can act, until you actually pay the ransom. Um, now, first thing I'm going to state up front is the Cyber Security, Australian Cyber Security Centre, their guideline says do not pay the ransom. And the simple reason behind that is when you've got no guarantee, you're actually going to get access to your data back, or two, that they're not going to hang on to it and read, you know, either ask for more. Um, so the simple thing is don't pay the ransom. A lot of people think backup is a uh, part of or the answer to a ransom attack. In some cases it can be, however also with ransomware you need to be aware that some ransomware they'll actually have a delay in the in the software so they'll, it mightn't uh, deploy until another week or two down the track when you've already backed up your data and it'll actually, your, your, the ransom, the, sorry, the malware is already caught up in your backup as well. So having a strong system is the best way, prevention is the best way, but if you obviously were attacked then having a proper disaster recovery plan in place that you work through with your IT or your managed service, IT managed service provider, that's the best way to mitigate these things. And there we, again, mitigation is pretty much exactly the same way. Staff training, web filtering, email filtering, application whitelisting, which means only certain applications can be used in your system. Um, you know, if somebody tries to load a program that they can't or run a program that's not whitelisted, that will block it from running. That's a good way to stop those things happening because sometimes code will be downloaded in things like a PDF document. It'll try and run something in the background that you don't see. That application whitelisting is a way of preventing that happening. And as I said, business got a new and disaster recovery plan is key. Um, this day, again, this report's a little bit out of date. Unfortunately, the uh, Cyber Security Centre hasn't updated this report for a while, or this actual graphic for a while. Um, but you can see that healthcare and social assistance is the number two industry for targets of malware, uh, sorry, um, um, ransomware. And it wouldn't surprise me these days if that if we're not actually number one. Uh, but either way, I'd be pretty confident that we're going to be number one or number two. So how do we look at this? And again, is your data secure? So security software is important. The cyber security software that you're using, make sure it's enterprise level and designed, customised to your particular circumstances. Make sure it's fit for purpose. The other thing is that make sure it's updated. Those security profiles that it's running actually up, are updated to the latest threats. Secure messaging, so if you're handling patient information, whether that's coming into your business, out of your business, if you're handling that, it really needs to be done via a secure method. There's a number of secure messaging options out there. You've got Argus, you've got medical objects, you've got HealthLink. Um, if you're doing e-referrals and you're in the Northern New South Wales, sorry, the Hunter New England part of our footprint, um, we've got the Centre referral system, uh, which private providers can access. There's no cost for that. Um, if you want more information on that, and that's a way of general practice, getting referrals to you through a secure system, it's completely encrypted, it's end to end. Um, if you want more information on that, just contact us at the PHN, uh, jump onto the, um, I'll give you a link at the end uh, to our um, digital health toolbox, and it's got all the information on that there, and I'm more than happy to help you out with that, but that's available. But also look at, the, as I say, those secure messaging systems for debt transfer of patient data. Um, because they, they, they are really the safest way of transferring that data. I often hear, what about faxing? Uh, yeah, look, we are the last bastion of faxing. Um, I'll cover faxing actually in a minute. Emails, what I would say, if you're using email to transfer patient data, please stop. If you're a general practice, sorry, I'll, I'll start that the other way around. If you're a specialist practice or an allied health practice, um, and you're asking general practices to email patient detail, email, refer email referrals to you, please stop. Please get secure messaging. If you're a general practice and you're getting asked to email that information, again, stop and say why. There are plenty of options there. You just need to have those in place. Email is not a secure way to transfer patient data. Um, a classic example has come out in the last week or so, Melbourne uh, Women's Hospital. They had uh, a data breach. 
what had actually happened was one of their staff was actually emailing patient details to their home email address. They were uh, then using that email address to coordinate patient appointments and things like that. A great idea, not. That their personal email attack was, sorry, their personal email account was compromised and the patient data was released. So, you know, email is not a secure method. Faxing, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we are the last bastion of faxing, but, you know, 1986 call, it wants its technology back. Um, it is out of date and it's not secure. People say, what about e-faxing? I think if you think about e-faxing, what you've got to remember is that e-fax is a piece of software that what it does, it you scan a document if you're sending an e-fax uh, e out, it scans, it then turns that document into a PDF. The actual transmission between point to point is actually done using fax protocols. But what that software does when, an, you know, when a fax comes in, it actually converts that, um, that file to a PDF, shoots it into your email, into you know, fax at practice name here, .com.au, shoots it into that email inbox, up to your email server, and that's where you get your fax from. So essentially, you're actually, while at the point to point data transfer, is done using fax protocols. It then becomes an email when it gets into your practice and it's subject then to the normal email protocols. So you've got to be aware that that's the case if you're using e-fax technology. Are your faxes encrypted? Is it your own email server? That it would be reducing the risk, but if you're using a third party email server, like Microsoft Office 365, those faxes or those emails are being stored in their environment. You need to know where that is, how secure that is, uh, because at the end of the day, if that's compromised, it's you that wears the data breach, not the not the provider. Sorry, that's the email provider. Um, IT, IT hygiene is another big one. Do you allow people to bring in you know, USB sticks and plug them into your technology at work? If so, no, it needs to stop. It's a great way of introducing, again, third-party software that might have malicious uh, code in it. Um, you should never be introducing any non-corporate um, assets into your um, environment, into your network, into any of your IT equipment. Make sure that doesn't happen. It needs to be part of your policies again, that that doesn't happen. Staff need to be aware of that. And it comes back to that, are these staff trained and regularly updated about cybersecurity? Uh, and I will give you some links off to some different um, training options um, towards the end of the presentation. But I think it's really important that you need to set a baseline within your business or your practice as to what your staff know. So cybersecurity training, it's available, for example, on the Digital Health, uh, the Australian Digital Health Agency website. They've got some great module-based training um, that you could actually put as or introduce as part of your induction. Set it now, do it as a baseline so you know what your staff know. You know they know the minimum. Um, PHN is also developing some training in those areas on data security and cybersecurity. It's not available yet. Um, stay tuned to our um, weekly newsletter and I'm sure when that's available, that'll come out in that publication. But there is a lot of training out there, but make sure it's done regularly. And as I say, use it as your induction as part of your baseline. The other thing is, I'm obviously sitting at home presenting this, nice and comfortable sitting here. So we're all remoting in. A lot of us are working on a hybrid model. Um, so we're all remoting into our work systems from home. How are we doing that? It's really important to understand that process and how it works. So, we're, you know, a lot of us use a remote desktop protocol or RDP. Um, how is that actually set up within your system? Is it password protected? Is it through a VPN? Do you have multi-factor authentication on it? Again, using that multi-factor authentication, you know, you, when you log into your uh, net bank and the bank will send you a code to your mobile phone, multi-factor authentication is exactly the same. You should have that set up so when you log in remotely, there's a way of checking. Our system, when we log in, if I log in from a different IP address, I've got to put in a, a six-digit number that I use I'm using Microsoft Authenticator on my phone. I've got to put that in. That means if somebody tries to you know, log in, in my, on my behalf, they don't have my phone, they can't actually put in that second factor authentication, access is blocked. The other thing is, does it have a limited login attempt? So if, again, if you get a brute force attack, will the system just shut it down after a certain number of attempts? Usually that's two or three attempts just to allow for a couple of mistakes, but then it should shut the system down and then you've got to go through your IT to actually get your access re-enabled. So it's really important to have that. If you're remote desktoping in, use those security factors to give you that protection. 
The other thing is, are you using your own corporate assets to actually access that remote desktop, access your own systems remotely? If you've got someone sitting at home using their own PC and they're running Windows 8 Home as their operating system with AVG Freeware as their security system, you might have a problem. So corporate assets are the best way to protect that because you control the security that's running on them, you control what's introduced on them, you can set those user permissions uh, and who can actually install what on those. So I think it's really important again to have, have that um, available if that's what you're doing. Mentioned user permissions, so they need to be tight enough to block potential threats, but also they need to be open enough to effectively allow people or your team to work within their job scope. So you can't lock systems down entirely. People have got to be able to do their work. So it's that fine line between the two. Work with your IT your, or your, um, your IT provider or your managed service provider, that term is interchangeable but work with them to work out who needs administrator level access, who doesn't, who needs to be able to install a program or a printer on, on your system and who doesn't. Keep all your software up to date and running the latest version. It's critical because a lot of the times you get an update, whether it be a, you know, a BIOS update or a clinical management system or an operating system update, it's got security patches in it. So if you don't run those on your system for a month or two down the track, your system is potentially open to attack during that time. So it's critical that those updates are run as soon as they're released by the software providers. Backups, backups are critical. Again, you've got to make sure that backups are done daily and that it's stored offsite. Doesn't matter whether you're using a cloud backup or a physical drive, long as it goes offsite, long as it's, you know, it's backed up daily, that's the main thing. The other thing is what's backed up. Make sure you know what's being backed up where it's backed up from on your system. Some systems will only look in certain file areas. So if you're backing up the clinical management system, it'll back that up, but it might not pick up something that's sitting on a person's desktop or sitting in their documents folder. So make sure you know where, what files or what folders are being backed up into your backup system. Because if you've, if you've got to recover from either a server failure or a cyber incident, you need to know what you've got and that it's going, you're going to be able to get up and running. So I mentioned their secondary server. It's not something that everybody's available to do, but I know in a practice that I managed some time ago, um, we actually superseded a server. Um, so what we did was set up the second server as a backup server. So we ran about 15 minutes behind the primary server. Uh, that meant that we had, if the primary server failed for some reason, we actually had a backup and we could get that back up and running pretty, pretty quickly. The other thing is any backup is only as good as its test. Have you actually, make sure you've run your test, tested your data recovery process, make sure you can actually recover and back up and do that at least a couple of times a year. I actually, sorry, a couple of times a year. Make sure your IT is across that, make sure they're doing that. Um, I did hear of a practice the other day that had, that had been, thought their information was being backed up, actually hadn't been backed up in over five years. So make sure that you're working with your IT people to make sure that everything is happening as you expect it is. Uh, policies and procedures, I've mentioned that a few times, they are critical. Uh, for our commission service providers, uh, we do provide you with the PHN provider information pack. Uh, that will give you what's required in regard to a digital health access policy. Um, it's expected that that policy is reviewed at least every two years and it should cover your digital in any aspect of digital health that's relevant to your organisation, uh, such as data safety and governance cybersecurity, privacy, electronic communication, data security. Uh, all of that information is covered in that for um, providers, for, for our commission service providers. For other um, businesses or practices, uh, there's some really good policies available, templates available on the um, um, Allied Health Professionals website, on the RACGP website, a um, lot of those things, just because it's on the RACGP, so the Royal Australasian College of General Practitioners, doesn't mean you can't take that and customise it to your business. Most of the concepts are exactly the same, you just need to customise it for what's actually happening in your business. A strong policy would have potentially blocked that Royal Melbourne Women's Hospital breach because that staff member would have known that they actually shouldn't be taking patient data and transferring it away from the, from the hospital or out of their own system. So that's where policies, Policies are important, your staff need to understand them. They should be living documents. They shouldn't be sitting on a shelf or in a folder gathering dust, um, or whether that be a virtual folder sitting in a, on a server gathering dust. They need to be able to be, everyone needs to be across them. You need to be able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. 
So it needs to form what you do every day and part of your daily procedures. I mentioned working with IT suppliers a lot. They're critical. If you're, you know, do you use an IT supplier? I would, you know, the, the old line that um, if you, a, a man who represents himself has a fool for a lawyer, the same goes if you're doing your own IT, I'm sorry. If you are not an IT expert, you should not be doing it because it is just too quickly moving, too changeable and too complex these days to be doing yourself. So you need a good IT supplier, a managed service provider that you can work with that tells you what they're doing and they work with you so that you get the best out of it, you know what's going on. They're not just sending you an invoice at the end of the month and you're hoping that everything's happening, you're actually able to understand. Do you or your managers know your IT administrator password? So if you had to change IT suppliers on short notice, does that mean you've got to blow your system up and start again with a new IT supplier or could they actually come in and pick up and take over the old system? So it's important to have that as part of your um, recovery plan as well. Um, it's, and, and if you're not given those information or not getting that information or you're not getting that level of feedback from your IT supplier, I often ask the question, do, do you work for them or do they work for you? Because if they're, if they're not, if it's not a two-way relation, symbiotic relationship, then I think you maybe have to you know, look at reviewing that. I won't focus, I know I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time here, so I won't focus on this a lot, I'll just run through them. But I, I pulled these slides together when I presented on a disaster, um, cyber security and disaster uh, presentation a couple of months back. And we looked at two scenarios on what would you actually have to work through if you had a physical on-premise server, or on-prem server it's sometimes known, uh, versus a cloud server. So running through it quickly, the purpose of the theft, you know, did you have a break in? Was it they looking for data? Were they looking for the actual physical IT hardware? Was it for ransom? Was it for fraud? How do you prevent that? So what's the data, what's practice security have you got? Have you got an alarm? Have you got monitored alarm systems? Have you got limited key access? Where's your server stored? Is it in a lock room or deadlock? Or is it sitting under a desk? Passwords, I go back to passwords all the time. And, and why we paying on about 40% of the respondents, we run a, a digital, what we call our, our general practice, Healthy Together Digital Care Survey. We've just run, run, run one as well for Allied Health. In our general practice survey, 40% of respondents said they stored passwords on paper, in notebooks or in a Word document. So this is why we go, you can have the best security, but if you've got your password sitting on the desk or in the top drawer, somebody comes in and takes your server, guess what, they've probably got access. The other thing is, what is your service level agreement with your IT MSP? I'm calling it an MSP there, but as I say, provider, managed service provider. Can they get you back up and running if you have an event where your server really goes down, it's stolen? Um, how can you actually get back up and running? Can they switch your physical server and your virtual machines into a cloud environment to get you back up and running in a short space of time? When I actually did that presentation a couple of months ago, I asked an IT provider uh, that I work with quite closely, if I came to you today and said, I want a replacement server, how long would it be? The answer was four months and $15,000. So I don't know any business can actually sit on their thumbs for four months while they wait for a new server. So it's critical that you've got that in place, that you're confident in your IT provider, that they can provide what you need so that you've got that business continuity. The other thing is, have you got business interruption insurance? What does it cover? Or probably more importantly, what doesn't it cover? You know, if you've got your password stored there in a password book uh, or something like that, does that void your insurance? Um, and also going back again, what's backed up? You know, if you lose all your data and you get a tax audit who can go back seven years, have you got that data? The other thing is, who do you need to advise if that event occurs? Is it the police? Obviously, your um, IT provider. Us as the PHN times, because obviously sometimes we can coordinate and provide advice in that. Your insurance, you need to tell your staff. No point coming in today. We don't have any equipment or we can't get up and running. But there'll be things that you've got to do. So it's again, having that policy in place. And is it a notifiable breach? Do you need to tell the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner? I'll cover that again in a few minutes. Scenario two, we looked at a cloud-based server and it's slightly different, but again, you could have a theft of your actual hardware, that can be taken. If your passwords are stored again, sitting on that uh, workstation that's in the practice that gets taken, they've got access to your cloud server, all of a sudden they've got access to your data. So having a cloud-based scenario, really doesn't protect you any, you any better if you've got easy access. Same sort of things go there with your replacement of your data, your downtime and who to advise and things like that. 
Interestingly, why I covered those two scenarios, they are actually scenarios that happened in our region in the last 12 months. We had one, we had broke into different premises. One was a cloud-based practice, one was a on-prem server. They were the two things that they actually had to work through. That was their real incidents that actually happened. Covering it, um, consent, and I know I'm running really short of time here, so I'm going to jump through this fairly quickly. I will read this slide. Consent is importantly, it's it's and this is a quote from Avant, and this is why I'd like to read it. It's not just about getting a signature on a form, rather it's about a process of shared decision making. Another colleague put it, the thing we need to understand about informed consent is that it's about the conversation, not the form. It's not about a tick list to ensure you've disclosed every consumer risk. It's about understanding the patient and what's materially relevant to them and working through that with the patient. And I think that's really important. Consent does have three aspects. Capacity, who can give informed consent? Can they give a... Do they have capacity to that? Disclosure, what information do they need to give that consent? And voluntariness, do they give that consent freely? Um, having decision-making uh, capacity can mean, you know, your patient understands or your client understands the facts involved. They understand the choices. They can weigh up the consequences of those choices and they understand the consequences and how they affect them and they can communicate that decision. Disclosure, as a clinician, um, you need to disclose what's relevant for that proposed treatment or procedure and provide information of any associated benefits and risks as they relate to the patient. Fairly standard stuff. And voluntariness, uh, always trip up over that word, apologies for that. <laughs> patient must be free to make their own decision. They can't be under you know, duress to make that decision. They've got to be able to make that without pressure or influence. Children and minors, this is where it gets nice and grey. Uh, love the law. Um, when can a child or minor provide consent? In Australia, we deem it at age 18, generally across most states. South Australia being the exception, they use age 16. However, before reaching the age of 18 or 16 in South Australia, a child can be deemed what they call a mature minor. That is, they're, they're Gillick competent. And the term Gillick competent comes from a uh, legal case out of Scotland off the top of my head uh, a number of years ago, basically where they decided the child could make a rational decision, an informed decision, and actually can give consent prior to turning age of 18. So that's a, a common concept within the medical field and, and not only within medicine, but certainly they, that is one that uh, we do use quite regularly and re rely on quite regularly. Medicare, so Medicare at age 14, patient, parents no longer have access to their child's Medicare claims online and also children can have their own Medicare card at age 15. Why I go into this, why the consent I go into this, talking about My Health Record, because it, again, it's very important for a number of our, for you out there to understand how the My Health Record works and what the consent levels are. So uh, a parent or guardian will have control over their child's My Health Record until they turn 14. At that time, a child who can prove to the digital health agency that they're a mature minor, they can actually then take control of their own uh, My Health Record. Um, and at age 14, children's parents or guardians are automatically removed from their My Health Record. Um, however, children can then give access back to their parent or guardian if they so wish at that age. One that comes up regularly is do I need, if I'm a clinician, do I need my patient's con access, consent to access their My Health Record? Simple answer to that is no. Uh, under the legislative framework for the My Health Record, you don't if you're a member of that patient's care team and you have a reasonable right to ex access that and the patient has a right to believe you would, you are part of their care team, then you can actually access that. Taking a step back though, best practices involve your patient in the discussion at all steps. If you're going to, if you, for some reason you want to look at their My Health Record, talk to them about it and why they want to do that. Or if you want to upload information again, let them know the benefits of that. In a, and it's a two-way dialogue so that they're informed along the way. But strictly speaking, you actually don't need access to that. Uh, sorry, don't need consent at each point to access a My Health Record. Patients can put in controls over their My Health Record. So they can put in restriction access codes, they can put a pin on their My Health Record. So only a clinician with a pin number can actually access that um, My Health Record. They can block certain documents using a docu document access code. They can turn off tracking, they can turn on tracking. There's a lot of different controls that patients can actually put in place around their My Health Record. Ultimately too, they can also uh, determine what is uploaded and they can delete certain documents off their My Health Record. Um, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, it's, you know, it does mean that sometimes the, the record is not accurate. And I think it's important to have that discussion with your patient if they're concerned about information that's there around the security and who can actually view that information. It is all tightly controlled. 
ultimately though a patient can actually decline any part of the My Health record, they can actually ask for it to be deleted and opt out. The downside of that is they do opt out, all the record is deleted and it can never be recovered. So if someone's concerned about that, I think it's really important to maybe have that discussion around the controls rather than deleting the record. Privacy legislation, I'm not going to go into this slide at all. If you're in this uh, webinar, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're covered by the Privacy Act of 1988. That's all we need to know. You should have your own privacy policies though. They should outline how you collect, what data you collect, how you treat it and who has access to it. Uh, I've got a picture of the RACGP guidelines up there. Again, you can use the RACGP guidelines. Allied Health uh, Professionals Australia has some really good in, uh, resources as well. So look at your own professional bodies for that information. Um, right of access to that patient information. Um, so patients um, can, you know, sorry, taking a step back. Patients have a right to their own health data or their file under that legislation. Um, they, they can, a lot of people think that um, they, if you, sorry, got lost in my own thoughts there. Patients do have a right to their own health data or their file under the privacy legislation. It's as simple as that. There are very few circumstances where you can actually deny a patient access to information that is in their patient file. Um, if you've got a letter from a specialist sitting on the patient file, if you're, or if you're a specialist or allied health practice and you're wasting your time putting this letter can only be released with the express permission of the writer, um, stop rubbish. It's not worth the paper you're writing it on. If that information forms part of the patient file, they have a right to access that. And there's very few circumstances where they can actually, where you as a health provider can actually not provide that information. So there are circumstances like it may threaten that patient's or somebody else's life or health or safety. It might impact on somebody else's privacy or if giving them the access would be unlawful. But in most circumstances, you've actually got to give that access to the patient. Now, it doesn't say you've got to give it in black and white. You don't have to hand it over as a, as a great wad of paper. You can actually you know, negotiate with the patient, have them come in, have a look at the file, talk through why you've got that information, what that information actually means. So if you're concerned about some of the data that's on their patient file, have a talk to them, understand why they want the information. We used to regularly find we'd get patients come in and say, oh, I want my file, I need access to my file, I want it printed out. After we probed that a little bit, we'd sometimes find out all they wanted to do was actually take it to another, take, transfer their file to another practice. So ask the questions, understand what your patient's thinking. Sometimes they just want to know what's on there. That's their right. Um, so a patient has full access to their file. I would suggest to you if you're actually going to deny a patient access to their file or part of their file, that you contact your professional indemnity advisor or reinsurer and talk that through with them so that they can give you a professional advice on that because it's a fairly rocky road if you're going to deny access. Um, right of access um, and as I mentioned that includes third party reports so however right of access by third parties that's a different story. Uh, third parties have no right to anyone's data uh, including your My Health record without a valid authority. Now valid authority will cover that but Third parties include employers, insurance agencies or insurance companies, law enforcement agencies, partners, spouses, children and parents, depending on the age of the child. None of those people have a right to somebody else's health information. Um, valid authority from the patient though, you can get that, can be in writing, it can be verbal. As with any of this information and going back to the consent as well, any of that, if it's verbal, document it on your file because if it's not documented on your file, it didn't happen. So document, document, document. Um, the exception of that is the My Health Record does have what they call a break glass feature. Um, that is if you are lying on a, an emergency department bed, you're non-compass and they, the treating clinicians think that there'd be information or they want to see in your My Health Record to see if there's information that might assist them with your treatment, they can actually use a break glass feature and access your My Health Record without your right, with that, sorry, without your express permission. Um, that is tracked and everything else, so they will be asked why they've done that. It's all fully tracked. Every access to a My Health Record is tracked, um, and they will be asked to explain that. Uh, if they can't provide a reasonable basis for their access, then obviously they'll be prosecuted, or they, sorry, not necessarily prosecuted, but they could be to the full extent of the law. And that's quite substantial penalties for, uh, for breaching the My Health Record. Um, 
people get confused sometimes with some of the documents that we use in privacy and, and accessing information. So in New South Wales, and I, I know we've got a couple of interstate people here, so I would say to you, check the uh, situations in your own state. Um, but in New South Wales, a power of attorney uh, and an enduring power of attorney does not provide access to health information. Power of attorneys are essentially financial instruments and they're valid for legal and financial decisions. They're not valid for health decisions. Enduring and guardianship in New South Wales, again, the appointment only provides for access and decision making after the individual who gave that enduring guardianship or granted that loses capacity. It doesn't come into play until they actually lose capacity. Each state does have different um, regulations. So that's why I'm saying check, check with uh, where the instrument was issued. For example, Queensland, an enduring power of attorney actually allows you to make health related decisions. So it is state by state. This is this wonderful Commonwealth of states that we live in. Um, so check state by state where, with what's the instrument you're looking at and what powers it has in your actual jurisdiction. Um, the other ways that people can access or access can be granted, of course, is, is legally, so via a subpoena, summons. If it's legislatively required or in certain emergency situations, as I mentioned, the break glass feature in my health record. But that's the only way that a third party can access your information. So a lot of people get worried if the information's going in there that an employer can access it or somebody else can access it. No, that information is not visible only to someone in the care team. So it's important to, to use, you know, to let people know that that information is very secure. Data breaches, what to do in the event of a data breach? Um, so when, it is, what, when, when does a data breach happen? So data breach happens when personal information is accessed or disclosed without the authorization or it's lost without the authorization of the actual owner of that, uh, da that data or that patient, if you like, that, that patient not giving that information. Quite explicit under the Privacy Act of 1988, but the good thing is the Office of the Australian, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner has some really good resources. Um, there's, I'll put up two links here shortly. Um, they will take you through. One, there's a, the first one is just a link to the Notify Bre Breaches page on their website. The second is actually a publication. It's a PDF publication that if you've got a breach or you think you've got a breach, follow that process through. Um, and that will help you determine if it's a notifiable breach because every breach is not necessarily notifiable. Depends on the what information has been disclosed, how it's been disclosed, has it been contained, is there serious harm potential, all those things. The guide will take you through that and it's the best way to work through it. I've been involved in a, a few different breaches over time um, and it really is a valuable tool. Okay. I wanted to finish up by jumping into the My Health app. Um, why I wanted to cover this was it was released in um, March this year by the Digital Health Agency. They've spent a lot of time working on it. It's a really great tool. Um, it's really good for patients. Um, and the other thing is some patients may have been using what was called the Health Now app. That's actually been decommissioned. It was a, an app I think that Telstra Health put out. It's been decommissioned at the end of the month and it is replaced by the My Health app. Um, this is really valuable. Again, it's, you're able to carry your health in the palm of your hand on your devices. Can be really valuable for some of those clinicians in, um, who don't necessarily have access to the My Health record. You know, you may not have conformance software. Uh, you may not at this stage have access through the national provider portal. Um, if you want more information on that, if you're working in allied health or in the, where you don't have uh, access via conformance software, the national provider portal is a way you can get access to My Health records. You can't upload information but you can download or view information. So if you want more information again come back to us at the PHN we can help you out with that. Um, but also yeah your patients can actually bring that information in on their phone really easy to do really uh, and the information they can access is up to date you know it's accurate so you know you're getting good information. So the app itself um, before a patient can actually set up the app what they need to do is obviously get the app on their device they can either go to the App Store or Google Play Store, depending on whether you're an Apple person or an Android person. Um, both have got the app. They're both the same app. Um, what you need to have done is have a MyGov account linked to your My Health record. Again, just log on to the website through your MyGov. You can link that up. Then you've got to access the My Health record at least once through the web browser. 
Um, I'll put some links up here again later to the Digital Health Agency site. There's a really good video on that that actually takes you through the process step by step. So um, even for the most, you know, technophobe, even for the, you know, the Luddites amongst us, yep, you'll be able to follow that through and it, it, it's actually very, really uh, easy to follow. So um, what's in it? You can view your health history, you can check pathology, you can manage vaccinations, you can track allergies and reactions, you can view hospital discharge summaries. Patients can keep track of their care planning documents. So, you know, they can upload um, advanced care planning documentation and things like that. Um, you can look at yours or family members if they've given access through the My Health Record to you. So you can manage multiple portfolios through the, uh, through the app and you can view medicine information. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that there's some really good information in there. Um, and it looks like there'll be more and more information going up to the My Health Record. The government's actually put out some consultation papers um, recently, and I think they're open to the end of the month, where they're actually looking to the changes they're looking to make. One is to mandate uploading of information through so, um, digital uh, diagnostic imaging and pathology information. That will actually be uploaded automatically rather than by exception. At the moment, uh, the pathology companies and radiology companies don't have to do it. They can opt into it, um, whereas they're going to make that compulsory. The other change that they're looking at that uh, the clinicians may want to look at is, and be part of the uh, consultation is they're actually looking at removing the seven-day delay on pathology and diagnostic imaging. Uh, so that once the uh, imaging company or the pathology company reports that, it'll actually show in the patient's My Health record immediately. So that's something that uh, there's yeah, some uh, some consultation going on, government's consulting on that, but they're two of the possible changes to My Health record that have been uh, announced in the last little while. Um, is your information secure? As I said, the My Health record has defence level technology. It's as secure as the Australian government can make it. It is constantly being updated. The app itself, uses your own devices, biometrics, so your fingerprint, your face ID, things like that to actually get into it. You can change your pin at any time, so you can update it if you think it's compromised. Um, you can do all of those changes and the app will actually log you out if you haven't used it for five minutes. So it's, it's very, very secure. Um, accessibility, um, it's been rated AA, that's what they're, they're aiming for. Um, accessibility, you know, is, is something they look at, but different things. Um, it's, you know, core communities, uh, different um, ethnic backgrounds, uh, people who for different disabilities. Is the um, app accessible to them? That's what they work through and they've got that as accessible as they can. So it's a, it's a really accessible app as well in that sense. I'm going to put that up there just for a second. If you're quick, you can probably grab that uh, QR code with your phone. Don't panic if you don't. It'll be in the um, documents when we send them out. Um, that will take you to the uh, to that page I mentioned on the Digital Health Agency site where you'll see that video and the step-by-step -step and what you need to do. As I say, don't panic. I'm going to jump off that now. I'm going to throw up a whole lot more links. Um, these will all be in the pack. So again, you don't need to scribble these down or take a photo or anything like that. Um, you'll get this information. I think we'll aim to have it up probably early next week. So if you check on the uh, the um, education team's event website where you'll find past events, that's where you'll get all this information from. I'll throw up one more slide and we'll take, uh, then take some questions. Uh, I think Emily's been busily, hopefully, monitoring all the questions that have come in. Hopefully we've got some. Um, these QR codes that I've developed here or got here, they take you off to a couple of interesting sites. So the first one on the top left is, have I been pawned? That's where you can put in your email address or your phone number, your mobile number, and actually see has your email address been compromised. Um, and it'll tell you what cyber events that's been compromised in. LinkedIn is a big one that a lot of people come up on. They had a cyber event a few years back and a lot of their data was um, compromised. Um, so you'll probably see LinkedIn if you've got an older email address there and you've used that for that po uh, profile and that, that piece of software. Um, the one on the right, top right, that's an ABC site. You can actually, that actually puts it together graphically. It's quite interesting to watch. Again, you put in your email address and it will actually build it graphically and show you how much information is actually out there based on your email address or your phone number. Uh, the other two there, the one on the left, PHN Digital Health, to, uh, PHN Digital Health Toolbox. Some really great resources on there. We're continually updating that. Uh, with information on cybersecurity, on uh, e-referrals, the centre e-referral system that I mentioned, 
um, on all different aspects of digital health. That's a great resource there. Uh, jump on there. It'll also have contact details for us. So if you do want any extra information, don't hesitate to get in touch with the digital health team. And then as I mentioned, I've mentioned it a couple of times, the PHN newsletter comes out every Tuesday and that will keep you abreast of all the different developments that are happening right across the PHN, whether it be education, whether it be digital health, all the different things, commissioning, all that information, grants, PHN newsletter is a great resource. So uh, I'll leave those up there for a little bit longer. Yes, you can click on those with your camera and uh, probably bring up those uh, links uh, and get that information. Last but not least, uh, one of the reasons we're running this this month is cyber, October is Cyber Security Month. So it's a really uh, opportune time to be talking about all things cyber security. So, uh, and, and it's a really good opportunity to, to raise that with your team. There's a lot of information out there. So, you know, jump into it with your team, talk about it with them, make sure they're abreast of it, make sure you understand what they know and what they don't know is the important bit. But I'm gonna stop there um, and I might uh, now take that screen down and Emily, I might come back if there's any, uh, and stop sharing my screen. Hopefully I'm back. Yeah, you are. Ah, there we go. Technology, Thank love you, it. Thank you, Peter, <laughs> for that fabulous presentation. So we don't have any questions, but if um, oh, anyone so does, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. So if you, if anyone does have questions, feel free to um, email the education team, um, or we will be uploading their slides and the PDF of the slides and the presentation to the website, as Peter was saying. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Peter? No, I wouldn't. I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, their time today. Uh, I hope it was uh, interesting and uh, that they all got something out of it. And as I say, we're always available to help out. Just contact us at the PHN. Thanks again. Thanks for your time, everybody. And thank you again, Peter. Thanks, everybody.